Section 11 of Astounding Stories 18, June 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand. Holocaust by Charles Willard Diffin. But who was Paul? This question kept coming repeatedly to my mind. The press of the country echoed the President's words, then dipped their pens in vitriol to heap scorching invective upon the head of the tyrant. The power of the Reds we might have met, or so it was felt, but this new menace gave the invaders a weapon we could not combat. It was power, a means of flight beyond anything known an explosive beside which our nitro compounds were playthings for a child. Who is Paul? It was not only myself who asked the question through those next long hours, but perhaps I was the only one in whose mind was a disturbing certainty that the answer was mine if I could but grasp it. I was remembering Paris. I was thinking of that peaceful, happy city before the first of May, before the world had gone mad and a raging red beast had laid it waste and overrun it, and of Paul Stravoinsky, my friend Strachey of college days, who had warned me. He had known what was coming. He himself had said that he had prayed to them for delay, that in a few weeks he would do what? And suddenly I knew. Paul had succeeded. His research had ended in the dissection of the atom, he had unleashed the subatomic power of matter. Only this could explain the wild flight through the sky, the terrific explosion at the capital. It was Paul, my friend Paul Stravoinsky, who was imposing his will upon the world. I said nothing as I took off. The swiftest plane was at my command. I might be wrong. I must not arouse false hopes. But I must find Paul and the papers were black with scareheads of another threat as I left Washington. You have twenty-four hours to surrender. There shall be one last day of grace. Signed, Paul. There was more of the wild talk of the beauties of this new dispensation, a mixture of idealistic folly and of threats of destruction. I needed no more to prove the truth of my suspicions. No one but the Paul I had known could cling so tenaciously to his dreams. No one but he could be so blind to the actual horror of the new oligarchy he would impose upon the world. I flew alone. No one but myself must try to hunt him out. I paid no attention to the radio direction of the last message. He would fly far afield to send it. Distance meant nothing to one who held his power. I must look for him at his laboratory that cluster of deserted buildings that stood all alone by a distant railway siding. It was there he had worked. He met me with a pistol in his hand, a tiny gun that fired only a point two two caliber bullet. Put down your pop gun, I told him, and brushed through the open door into the room that had been his laboratory. I'm unarmed, and I'm here to talk business. You are Paul! I shot the sentence at him as if it were a bullet that must strike him down. He did not answer directly, just nodded in confirmation of some unspoken thought. "'You have found me,' he said slowly. "'You were the only one I feared.' Then he came out with it, and his eyes blazed with a maniacal light. "'Yes, I am poor, and this pop-gun in my hand is the weapon that destroyed your capital at Washington.' The bullet contained less than a grain of tritonite. That is the name I have given my explosive. He aimed the little pistol towards me where I stood. These bullets are more lightly charged. They are to protect myself, and the one ten-thousandth of a milligram in the end of each will blow you into bits. Sit down. I will not be checked now. You will never leave this place alive. Less than a grain of tritonite? and I had seen a great building go down to dust at its touch. I sat down in the chair where he directed, and I turned away from the fanatical glare of Paul's eyes to look about me. There was poverty here no longer, 
No makeshift apparatus greeted my eyes, but the finest of laboratory equipment. Paul read my thoughts. They have been liberal, he told me. The Central Council has financed my work, though I have kept my whereabouts a secret even from them. But they would not wait. I told you in Paris, and you did not believe. And now? Now I have succeeded. The research is done. He half turned to pick up a flake of platinum no larger than one's fingernail. It was a weight that was used on a delicate balance. Matter is matter no longer, he said. I have resolved it into energy. I hold here in my hand power to destroy an army or to drive a fleet of ships. I, Paul, will build a new world. I will give to man a surcease from labor. I will give him rest. I will do the work of the world. My tritonite that can destroy can also create. It shall be used for that alone. This is the end of war. Here is wealth, here is power. I shall give it to mankind, and, under the rule of the Brotherhood, a united world will arise and go forward to new growth, to a greater civilization, to a building of a new heaven on earth. He was pacing up and down the room. His hands were shaking. The muscles of his face that twitched and trembled were molded into deep lines. I sat there and realized that within that room, directly before my eyes, was the dictator of the world. It was true. I could not doubt it. Paul Strachey of college days had made his dreams come true. His research was ended. And this new Paul, who held in those trembling hands the destinies of mankind, at whose word kings and presidents trembled, was utterly mad. I tried to talk and tell him of the truth we knew was true. He would have none of it. His dreams possessed him. In the bloody flag of this new Russia, he could see only the emblem of freedom. The men who marched beneath that banner were his brothers, unwitting in the destruction they wrought. It was all that they knew, but they fought for the right. They would cease fighting now and would join him in the work of moulding a new race. And even their leaders, who had sometimes opposed, were they not kind at heart? Had they not checked the advance of an irresistible army to give him and his new weapon an opportunity to open the eyes of the people? Theirs was no wish to destroy. Their hearts ached for their victims who refused to listen and could be convinced only by force. And as he talked on, there passed before my eyes the vision of an aerial torpedo and a blood-red ship above, where these kindly men, who were Paul's allies, turned the instrument of death upon huddled screaming folk, and laughed, no doubt, at such good sport. I thought of many things. I was tense one moment to throw myself upon the man, and an instant later I was searching my mind for some argument, some gleam of reason, with which I could tear aside the illusions that held him. I saw him across the room where a radio stood, and he switched on the instrument for the news broadcast surface. The shouting of an excited voice burst into the room. "'The Reds have advanced!' said the voice. "'Their armies have crossed the Connecticut line. They are within ten miles of the American forces. The twenty-four hours of grace promised by the tyrant Paul was a lie. The battle is already on!' I saw the tall figure of Paul sink to its former stoop. The lameness that had vanished in the moment of his exultation had returned. He limped a pace or two toward me. They said they would wait. His voice was a hoarse whisper. General Vornikov himself gave me his promise. I was on my feet then. What matter? I shouted. What difference does it make? A few hours or a day? Your damn patriots, your dear brothers in arms, they're destroying us this instant. And not one of our men, but is worth more than the whole beastly mob. I was wild with the picture that came so clear and plain before my eyes. I had my pistol in my hand. I was tempted to fire. It was his whisper that stopped me. They have crossed Massachusetts. And my Eda is there in Melford. There was no resisting his strength that tore my weapon from me. His tritonite pistol was pressed into my side, and his hand upon my collar threw me ahead of him towards a rear room then out into a huge shed. I only had a quick glimpse of the airplane that was housed there. 
It was a white cylinder, and the stern that was towards me showed a funnel-shaped port. I was thrown by that same furious strength through a door of the ship. I saw Paul Stravoinsky seat himself before some curious controls. The ship that held me rose, moved slowly through an open door, and with a screech from the stern it tore off and up into the air. I have said Paul could fly, but the terrific flight of the screaming thing that held us seemed beyond the power of man to control. I was stunned with the thundering roar and the speed that held me down and back against a cabin wall. How he found Melford I cannot know, but he found it as a homing pigeon finds its loft. He checked our speed with a sickening swiftness that made my brain reel. There were red ships above, but they let the white ship pass, unchallenged. There were no red soldiers on the ground, only the marks where they had passed. From the distance came a never-ceasing thunder of guns. The village was quiet. It still burned, blazing brightly in places, again smouldering sluggishly, and sending into the still air smoke clouds whose fumes were a choking horror of burned flesh. There were bodies in grotesque scattering about the streets. Some of them were black and charred. Paul Stravoinsky took me with him as he dashed for a house that the flames had not touched, and I was with him as he smashed at the door and broke into the room. There was splintered furniture about, a cabinet whose glass doors had been wantonly smashed, leaned crazily above its fallen books, now torn, scuffed, and muddy upon the floor. Through a shattered window in the bedroom beyond came a puff of the acrid smoke from outside to strangle the breath in my throat. On the floor, in a shadowed corner, lay the body of a woman, a young woman as her clotted tangle of golden hair gave witness. She stirred and moaned half-consciously, and the lined face of Paul Stravoinsky was a terrible thing to see as he went stumblingly across the room to gather that body into his arms. I had known Maida. I had seen their love begin in college days. I had known a laughing girl with sunshine in her hair, a girl whose soft eyes had grown so tenderly deep when they rested upon Paul. But this that he took in his arms, while a single dry sob tore harshly at his throat, this was never Maida. There were red drops that struck upon his hands or fell sluggishly to the floor. The head and face had taken the blow of a clubbed rifle or a heavy boot. The eyes in that tortured face opened to rest upon Paul's. The lips were moving. I told them of you, I heard her whisper. I told them that you would come, and they laughed. Unconsciously she tried to draw her torn clothing about her, an instinctive reaction to some dim realization of her nakedness. She was breathing feebly. And now, oh, Paul, Paul, you have come too late. I hardly think Paul knew I was there or sensed that I'd followed where he carried in his arms that bruised body that had housed the spirit of Maida. He flew homeward like a demon, but he moved as one in a dream. Only when I went with him into the room where he had worked did he turn on me in sudden fury. Out! he screamed. Get out of my sight! It is you who have done this, your damned armies, who would not do as I ordered. If you had not resisted, if you had... I broke in there. Did we do that? I outshouted him, and I pointed to the torn body on a cot. His eyes followed my shaking hand. No, it was your brothers, your dear comrades, who are bringing the brotherhood of men into the world. Well, are you proud? Are you happy and satisfied with what your brothers do with women? It must be a fearful thing to have one's dreams turn bitter and poisonous. Paul Stravoinsky seemed about to spring on me. He was crouched and the muscles of his thin neck were like wire. His face was a ghastly thing, his eyes so staring bright, and the sensitive mouth twisting horribly. But he sprang at last, not at me, but towards the door, and without a word from his tortured lips, he opened it and motioned me out. Even there I heard echoes of distant guns and the heavier thudding sounds that must be their aerial torpedoes. My feet were leaden as I strained every muscle to hurry toward my ship, through my mind was running the threat of the Russian, Vornikov. 
the Evangelion a day in thirty days. And this was the thirtieth day, thirty days that a state of war had existed. The battle was on. The radio had spoken truly. I saw its raging fires as I came up from our rear, where the grey-like smoke clouds shivered in the unending blast. But I saw stabbing flames that struck upward from the ground to make a wall of sharp, fiery spears, and I knew that every darting flame was launching a projectile from our anti-aircraft guns. The skies were filled with the red aircraft of the enemy, but their way was an avenue of hell where thousands of shells filled the air with their crashing explosions. There were torpedoes, the unmanned airships whose cargo was death, and they were guided to their marks despite the inferno that raged about above the red ships. I saw meteors that fell, the red flames that enveloped them no redder than the bodies of the ships, and, as I leapt from my plane that I had landed back of our lines, I sensed that the enemy was withdrawing. There was a colonel of artillery. I had known him in days of peace, and he threw his arms around me and executed a crazy dance. We bend them back, Bob, he shouted, and repeated it over and over in a delirium of joy. I couldn't believe it. Not those cruisers that I had seen over Paris. Another brief moment showed my fears were all too rational. A shrieking hailstorm of torpedoes preceded them. The ships were directing them from afar, and while some of the big shells went wild and overshot our lines, there were plenty that found their mark. I was smashed flat by a stunning concussion. Behind me, the place where Colonel Hartwell had stood, was a smoking crater. His battery of guns had been blasted from the earth. Up and down the whole line, far beyond the range of my sight, the eruption continued. The ground was a volcano of flame, as if the earth had opened to let through the interior fires, and the air was filled with a litter of torn bodies and sections of shattered guns. No human force could stand up under such bombardment. Like others about me, I gripped tight upon something within me that was my self-control, and I marveled that I yet lived while I waited for the end. Beyond the smoke clouds was a hillside, swarming with figures in red, solid masses of troops that came toward us. Above was the Red Fleet, passing safely above our flame-blasted lines. There were bombs falling upon those batteries here and there whose fire was unsilenced, and then from the south came a roar that pierced even the bedlam about me. The sun shone brightly there where the smoke clouds had not reached, and it glinted and sparkled from the wings of a myriad of our planes. There was something that pulled tight at my throat. I know I tore at it with fumbling hands, as if that something were an actual band that had clamped down and choked me, while I stared at that true line of sharp-pointed V's. The Air Force of the United States had been ordered in, and they were coming, coming, to an inevitable death. I tried to tear my eyes away from that oncoming fleet, but I could not move. I saw their first contact with the enemy, so small they were, in contrast with the big red cruisers. They attacked in formations, they drove down and in, and they circled and whirled before they fluttered to earth. Dimly, through the stupor that numbed my brain, I heard men about me shouting with joy. I felt more than saw the fall of a monster red craft. It struck not far away. The voices were thanking God. For what? Another red ship fell, and another, and through all the roaring inferno a sound was tearing, a ripping, terrible scream that went on and on and above me, when I forced my eyes upward, was a flash of white. It darted like a live thing among the red ones whose guns blazed madly, and the red ships in clotted groups fell away and over and down as the white one passed. They had been burst open where some power had blasted them, and their torn hulls showed gaping as they fell. For a time the air was silent and empty above. The white flashing thing had passed from sight, for the line of red ships was long. Then again it returned, and it threw itself into the mad whirl in the south where the air force of the American people was fighting its last fight. I was screaming insanely as I saw it come back. The white ship! The blast of vapor from its funneled stern. It was Paul, Paul Stravoinsky, Paul the dictator, and he was fighting on our side. His ship had been prepared. I had seen the machine guns on her bow. Paul was working them from within, 
and every bullet was tipped with the product of his brain, the deadly tritonite. The white flash swung wide in a circle that took it far away. It came back above the advancing army of the Reds. It swerved once wildly, then settled again upon its course, and the raging hell that the Reds had turned loose upon our lines was as nothing to the destruction that poured upon the Red troops from above. A messenger of peace, that ship, I knew well why Paul had painted it white, and, instead of peace, he was flying a full mile from our lines, yet the torn earth and great boulders crashed among us even then. There were machine guns firing ceaselessly from the underside of the ship. What charges of tritonite had the demented man placed in those shells? Below and behind it, as it flashed across our view, was a fearful writhing mass where the earth itself rose up in unending convulsive agony. A volcano of fire followed him, a fountain of earth that ripped and tore and stretched itself in a writhing tortured line across the land as the white ship passed. No man who saw that and lived has found words to describe the progress of that monstrous serpent. The valley itself is there for men to see. The roar was beyond the limit of men's strained nerves. I found myself cowering upon the ground when the white ship came back. I followed it fearfully with my eyes, until I saw it swoop falteringly down. Such power seemed not for men, but for gods. I could not have met Paul Stravoinsky then, but in a posture of supplication. But I leapt to my feet and raced madly across the torn earth, as I saw the white ship touch the ground, rise, fall again, and end its flight where it ploughed a furrow across a brown field. I raised Paul Stravoinsky's head in my arms where I found him in the ship. An enemy shell had entered that cabin. It must have come early in the fight. But he had fought gamely on. And the eyes that looked up into mine had none of the wild light I had seen. They were the eyes of Paul Strachey, the comrade of those few long years before, and he smiled as he said, Voila, friend Bob. C'est fini. And now I go for a long, long walk. We will talk of poetry, Maida and I. But his dreams were still with him. He opened his eyes to stare intently at me. You will see that it is not in vain, he questioned, then smiled as one who is at peace as he whispered, Yes, I know you will, my friend, Bob. And his fixed gaze went through and beyond me, while he tried in broken sentences to give the vision that had been his, so plain it was to him now. The vile work of a mistaken people. America will undo it. A world of peace. The vast commerce of the skies. I see it so clearly. It will break down all barriers. A beautiful happy world his lips moved feebly at the last i could not speak could not even call him by name i could only lean my head closer to hear one whispered word then another a fragment of poetry i had heard him quoted often but the whispered words were not for me paul was speaking to someone beside him someone my blind human eyes could not see I'm writing these words at my desk in the great transportation building in New York. It stands upon the site of the Chrysler building that towered here, until one of the flying torpedoes came over to hunt it out. They landed several in New York. How long ago it all seems that the threat of utter destruction hung over the whole nation, the whole world. And now, from my window, I see the sparkling flash of ships. The air is filled with them. I'm still unaccustomed to their speed, but a wisp of vapour from each bell-shaped stern throws them swiftly on their way. It marks the continuous explosion of that marvel of a new age, Tritonite. There are tremendous terminals being built. The air transport lines are being welded into efficient units that circle the world, and the world is becoming so small. The barriers are gone. All nations are working as one to use wisely this strange new power for the work of this new world. No more poverty. 
no more of the want and desperate struggle that leads a whole people into the insane horrors of war. It is a glorious world of which we dream, and which is coming slowly to be. But I think we must dream well, and work well, to bring to actuality the beautiful visions in those far-seeing eyes of the man called Paul, dictator one time, of the world. End of section 11 End of the Holocaust by Charles Willard Diffin Read by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand